Thanks for joining us today, everybody. In the legislative building in Regina, we have Premier Scott Moe and Dr. Saqib Shahab. Joining us on the line, we have Marlo Pritchard, President of the Saskatchewan Public Safety Agency. We have Scott Livingstone, CEO of the Saskatchewan Health Authority. And we have Dr. Susan Shaw, Chief Medical Officer with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Uh, both Premier Moe and Dr. Shahab will have opening statements, and then we'll have time for questions. Premier. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us today. Today we are reporting four new cases, as well as 11 new recoveries. All of the cases are in the far north, and the situation there appears to be improving. The virus continues to spread, however, uh, throughout uh, the far north, but, not, but it is spreading at a much slower pace than it was a week ago or, or 10 days ago. And that is thanks to the tremendous effort by so many people uh, in that area, all working together, all working collectively to address the outbreak. What you're doing, it's working. So once again, I say thank you. Over the past three days, we have had no new cases outside of the far north. And the number of active cases continues to steadily decline. This is good news. But I still need to once again remind everyone to continue be, to be careful, as we are now at a very crucial moment. With the weather getting warmer and the long weekend coming up, we are seeing a great many, great many more people that are out and about, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's, it's great to see. So long as everyone keeps up all of the good physical distancing measures that have been working so very well thus far. This weekend, you might be enjoying your first round of golf of the season, or you might be heading to the lake to do some day fishing. Or you might just be having a backyard barbecue with family and friends from one or, or possibly two other households. And on Tuesday, we are going to see a great many, a, a number of additional businesses that will reopen in communities across the province. And it is great to see this taking place. But it will only be successful if we keep up all of the good practices that we've learned and become accustomed to over the course of the past couple of months. We know that this virus can be controlled if we continue to do the right things. But we also know that it can spread quickly if we don't do those things. So let's be careful so that we can re keep reopening our economy and enjoying our beautiful province at the same time. Today we are highlighting a number of new uh, highway projects under the Building a Strong Saskatchewan plan that we released the other day. An additional $300 million is being invested in highways and in transportation projects as we work to quickly restart the Saskatchewan economy. These projects will include upgrades to 325 kilometres of thin membrane surface highways or TMS highways, 24 to 26 new sets of highway passing lanes across the province, and rehabilitation of at least 100 RM roads when combined with our existing municipal roads program, as well as some improvements to our community airports. This is in addition to the $358 million worth of highway projects and highways investments that were previously announced in the March spending estimates, including nine sets of passing lanes, as well as resurfacing projects between Regina and the Canada-US border. Four sets of passing lanes, as well as resurfacing between Delisle and Kindersley, and two sets of passing lanes and resurfacing projects, as well as widening between Saskatoon and the junction of Highway 2. Three sets of passing lanes on Highway 10 between Melville and Yorkton, as well as three sets of pa passing lanes on Highway 9 between Yorkton and Kenora. This year's plan includes improvements to more than 1,000 kilometres of provincial highways, which is the first year of the 10-year growth plan to build and upgrade over 10,000 kilometres of highways. And finally, I just want to mention that our government has responded to the Chief Electoral Officer's recommendations to ensure that a safe and successful fall provincial election can occur. Today, Cabinet approved the changes to the Election Act regulations to give the Chief Electoral Officer clear authority to take any necessary action that he seems necessary to ensure that the October 26th provincial election is conducted safely in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. These regulation changes clearly define a, a public health emergency as an emergency under the Elections Act and gives the Chief Electoral Officer the power to adapt any provisions to the Act to address health and safety concerns 
Everyone needs to feel safe about having the opportunity to go vote this fall. That means ensuring good physical distancing practices for both voters as well as election Saskatchewan workers, just like we do now in grocery stores and many other public places. I have every confidence that the election Saskatchewan will take the right steps to ensure that a safe ele election can be conducted for all of those involved. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Shahab for a few comments. Thank you, Premier. So just, um, um, you know, summarizing some of the numbers, I think we need to recognize that there are two slightly different stories occurring in Saskatchewan, and both are very positive. First of all, we all know that there was an intense outbreak in the Northwest, which is now on, uh, on the way down, and this was due to the significant efforts by Northern leadership, uh, by health staff, public health in the North, with great support by the Saskatchewan Health Authority, by the Saskatchewan Public Safety Agency, policing, other partners, social services, all coming together and supporting communities in the Northwest to really manage the outbreak in a way that it's certainly showing results. And I think this is really positive, that even if there is an outbreak in the North, uh, you know, this shows that with de determination and coordinated effort, it can be overcome. So that's, I think we just need to recognize the efforts that are put in place for that. But of course, they need to sustain the effort um, and we need to continue supporting that effort so that it finally, you know, settles down to and comes to the same level as the rest of Saskatchewan. And that, of course, is the other story that uh, with very few active cases and no active cases in, the, uh, in most of Saskatchewan, you know, it really does set up us well for reopening of phase two next week. And, but again, to reinforce um, what the Premier said, we need to continue as we go out and about and enjoy the outdoors and enjoy the warm weather enjoy the long weekend. We need to continue to have that, uh, uh, you know, diligence to maintain physical distancing between members who are not part of our household or our virtual household. And as long as we can do that, you know, we can continue to reopen other sectors of the economy and stay the course. But of course, if there is a cluster or an outbreak, that will then have to be managed within the context of the, or the setting in which that has happened. Uh, and again, you know, uh, we get, lo get lots of messages that uh, gatherings of 10 are allowed. Can I go out with my 10 friends or have them over? You know, I think it, it, it is important to recognize that we do want to, th there's going to be an increase in uh, our social interactions, even though we are going to be maintaining physical distancing as we go out and about um, um, uh, once phase two reopens. It is going to I increase a bit our social mixing. So as much as we can limit uh, social mixing in our social lives, I think that is good. So, you know, the recommendation still is that while gatherings of up to 10 are allowed, it is a strong recommendation that stick to two or three friends or two or three households and meet among yourselves as a virtual household and not have 10, uh, meet with 10 new people every day because that just increases the risk overall, even when things are very quiet. And we just need to stay the course uh, as uh, uh, um, phase two opens and look at future uh, opportunities uh, while maintaining some discipline in uh, our social lives and as we are out and about enjoying the outdoors. So I'll just stop there, thanks. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Premier. We now have about half an hour for questions. We'll take our first question from the room here, Arthur. So this is for the SHA. Um, <clears throat> I've been getting reports that, that the uh, number of mobile testing teams in the Wolosh area has fallen far short of the 19 that were promised at first. Uh, I've heard two, I've heard four, it varies. Um, I was wondering if you could confirm how many there are and explain if it has fallen short of that 19, why, and whether that's had any impact on your testing capacity. For the SHA on the line, could you hear the question? Yeah. Thanks for that, Arthur. So <clears throat> again, after we did initial planning and identified what we were needing to do to increase mobile testing in LOSH, which was the announcement of those multiple teams, the MHO <clears throat> in that community, um, through their order, began to stay at home and, and felt that we needed to change the strategy. So to ensure that we were containing the spread of the infection, as you know, we, we launched the second phase of active case finding, which included door-to-door -door strategic testing approach. And we have deployed over 35 staff uh, to the wash to do that, which includes door-to-door -door assessment, mobile testing, the drive-through swabbing, case identification, contact tracing. The mobile team 
Um, there, there are not 19 mobile teams because although they would have enough people to break them up into the teams, they've made it a smaller group of folks going door to door, coordinating with the community leaders and ensuring that we are keeping up with both, not just our swabbing and testing capacity, which has never been at risk. Uh, we are still and continue to swab and are committed to going to every single household in that community. I believe we've already gone to 200 uh, and that will continue. And as you can see by the results, uh, in the north, we are making progress with respect to not just identifying the cases, but also containing the spread. The, the results over the last few days uh, are confirming that. And we will continue to do advanced testing uh, throughout the community, not just on uh, close contacts and folks with symptoms, but asymptomatic folks and anyone who's looking to get tested up in the final. So no, it did not affect our testing strategy. Paul MacArthur? Yeah, so First off, how how can we? 200 is only a fraction of the population of that community. How can we know that these lower case numbers aren't related to, uh, to 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 our testing strategy? First of all, and I also wanted to go in a slightly different direction here because I've been hearing concerns from rural residents, uh, particularly in the community of Arcola, uh, who 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 have a lot of concerns about the plan to close the emergency room of their hospital. And, and I guess I'm just curious why we're moving forward with that when there's essentially no cases in the southern region of the province. Okay. Well, there's a couple of questions in there, so let me deal with the first one, Arthur, around the 200 people. I didn't say 200 people, I said 200 households. And as we talked about before, there's 750 households in the Lawashan area, and we will be going door to door to all of them over the next week. So it's 200 households, with not 200 individuals. There's been well more than that tested. I don't know how the exact number, but we could get that on follow-up. With respect to the alternative level care conversions in the 12 facilities in rural Saskatchewan, which were part of the defensive strategy associated with both the COVID response, also related to our building capacity to restart the healthcare system. And at the same time, protect those residents in long-term care that are in integrated facilities why we're moving forward with the plan is multifold. The one is to protect those folks in long-term care and to use the facility's capacity to provide care for alternative level of care positions in our larger facilities so that we can both build capacity to support the reopening of the healthcare system, but also maintain capacity for COVID surge and outbreak as they arise throughout the pandemic. So, so this was announced weeks ago. There have been discussions with local communities and mayors around this. And, and we, we, when we said we were going to implement it in four to six weeks, we started doing that last week and this week, and that's where we are today. And we will continue to manage our capacity. As the Premier has referred to it before, you know, once we restart our healthcare system next week, we will be using that dimmer switch as we watch what happens across the province with respect to you know, the mixing of, of individuals with re reduced restrictions and in the opening of other components of the economy, we'll have to jump on those outbreaks and that may change the types of services we are able to offer to the community based on how we're managing COVID surges throughout this period of time. I just add to that, Arthur, and this is a, a, a note of appreciation to the federal government for their support in the uh, uh, in our efforts in in Lalash and in, in Clearwater and in that region, they first uh, the federal government had supplied or provided us with twenty five thousand or some personal protective equipment in the way of twenty five thousand sets of gloves as well as some masks. Uh, more recently, the federal government has also uh, provided us with a thousand cartridges for our Gen Expert kit to use uh, not only in the in the Lalash area but throughout the north. And and uh, so, in addition to us having the the testing capacity through the Roy Romano lab uh, to test all of the households in Lalash if people should choose to, to test. We also have that, that rapid turnaround uh, capacity in the community as well. For those that may be uh, deemed to be at higher risk and you want to get a, a, a quicker turnaround of the results of your test so that you can move right into your, your contact tracing. So uh, the federal government has been very supportive of, of the, the initiatives uh, that, that we have been uh, conducting in, in Lalash and for that we're appreciative. We'll take our next question from the phone line operator. We have Alicia Bridges with CBC. Thank you. Uh, my first question is regarding the North. Is the Saskatchewan government actively considering relaxing the Northern travel restrictions for residents in the Northeast region of the administrative district or any parts of the district? And if so, which specific areas? 
So there, there is a conversation, well, conversations ongoing with respect to all of our public health orders, but in particular in the, and Dr. Shahab may have a, a little more uh, to add to this, um, uh, but understanding uh, that we moved with a public health order across the north as we saw an outbreak uh, that was starting uh, and in, in motion really in the northwestern portion of, of, uh, of the province. Um, and it was spreading into communities near there and there was nervousness that it was spreading into other communities not only throughout the north but uh, also into southern uh, southern communities in the province as well so we we had uh, put dr shahab had put forward a, a public health order uh, limiting the travel uh, not only north and south into the northern administration district but also between the communities in the northern administration district and really what that was to do uh, was to settle down the spread of this virus and to really uh, get a uh, control uh, over the spread of the virus so that it doesn't get into all of our all of our northern communities and into many other communities in the province and I think with uh, the numbers that we have seen uh, since that um, that public health order has been put in place is they are improving and we are starting to get to a much more manageable uh, situation and we are able now to say that there are, for the, all intents and purposes, not, uh, I believe, any active cases in the northeast or, or the central areas of, of the northern part of this province, and they are concentrated into that northwestern region, and we're working very hard uh, to ensure that we're able to get uh, that particular outbreak under control, and with the help of local leadership and, and individuals, uh, I think is uh, really a thank you to individuals for uh, uh, progressing and taking uh, their personal responsibility around physical distancing very seriously. Uh, we are getting this into a manageable situation. So um, in the days ahead, not before uh, the May long weekend, this coming weekend, uh, but in the days ahead, um, I think it is fair to say that if these numbers hold, uh, we will uh, have a, a discussion uh, with northern leaders uh, as well as uh, uh, with others on can we uh, really focus our restrictions to where they need to be um, and, and ensure that the restrictions are uh, doing uh, what they set out to do, which is to curb the spread of co the COVID-19 virus and, and, and not impact uh, those communities that aren't currently uh, being impacted with infections. But uh, like I said, that, that's days away, uh, not, not previous to this weekend. Anything to add to that, uh, Mr. Doctor? Follow-up, Felicia? Yes, thank you. Uh, this, this next question is related to reopening next week. Can you explain why malls will be allowed to open on Tuesday, but libraries that provide public services can't be open? So what would be open, sorry? Malls. Uh, malls, oh. sorry. Do you, do you want to speak to that, Doctor? Well, I think, um, uh, obviously there's, you know, with uh, zero active cases in most of Saskatchewan, there's a lot of interest in in uh, many sectors reopening and uh, we can understand that. Uh, but we had to start in a phased stepwise way, in a way that we can closely monitor as various sectors open. Uh, first of all, to make sure that as businesses open, they're able to apply the learnings from uh, the essential services that were open throughout. And then as they open, uh, both customers and business owners are able to operate in a way that we do, do not see any increase in transmission. So from that perspective, obviously um, in phase two, there are non-essential retail uh, and some personal services that will open. And it is critical that we are able to see that uh, after, uh, you know, for at least a two to four week period, once uh, phase two reopens, we do not see any increase in transmission. And once that, uh, uh, you know, there'll be consideration of uh, phases in, in the future. And we also understand that when you go into a retail environment, uh, there's clear guidelines about, you know, minimizing uh, browsing, touching multiple ar articles, picking what you need. Uh, the way uh, businesses are being designed is that there's always that physical distancing, either as you're going about the aisles or as you're going at the checkout. Um, in, in libraries and those kind of settings, it's a different environment. There's, you know, um, terminals with computers, there's lots of areas for children. Those are very uh, environments that are very enriching. Uh, so special consideration needs to uh, be given to those environments which are a bit different from a retail environment. I would just add, Alicia, with respect to malls, uh, it, it, again, I go back to the, uh, the dimmer switch analogy, if you will, uh, where there are still going to be uh, quite serious restrictions around food courts, for example, in some of the uh, communal areas where people might eat. Uh, so there, there's, it isn't a, a, 
100% back to normal in the retail environment in malls. Uh, it most certainly is providing those retail establishments the opportunity to open, um, but there still are a number of restrictions on how they'll operate within their uh, retail facility as well as how the, the broader mall is actually going to uh, have access uh, to certain areas of the mall, such as the food court. Let's take our next question from the room, Steph. Yeah. Mr. Premier, there were concerns raised by First Nation in Saskatchewan of RCMP officers attempting to stop uh, a traditional Indigenous ceremony from happening on First Nations territory. We know that there is a 10-person limit on gatherings in Saskatchewan. Why is there no exemption given to uh, First Nations ceremonies, traditional Indigenous uh, ceremonies on their land um, to allow for more than 10 people? Because the virus doesn't care. It just simply doesn't. Um, there are other religious and cultural uh, uh, gatherings that uh, have gone to great lengths uh, to modify their worship services, to modify their gatherings, uh, so that they may uh, continue to occur, but in a much, much uh, different fashion than, than what they may have uh, previously. We're nearing the end of the, of, the, of the season of Ramadan, for example, where we have seen, um, you know, a very different uh, um, uh, celebration of Ramadan than we have likely ever seen in, in, in for sure my history and, and I think probably every living person's uh, history. So the fact of the matter is is uh, this virus is very indiscriminate in how it spreads and who it impacts and affects and the, uh, the public health orders that are in place, um, they need to be followed for the safety and health of, of everyone. Follow-up stuff? Yeah, it's a different, it's a bit of a different question, an entirely different question. Um, it's presenting spending estimates and then three different scenarios for revenue projections is not the same thing as a full budget. Right. Will you present a full budget before people go to the polls in the legislature? Our intent and our preference would be to prevent, to present, uh, pardon me, a, a budget uh, in the legislature so that it can have uh, the legislative oversight that it should have and that, quite frankly, uh, all budgets deserve and in particular this budget deserves. Um, that being said, um, an, an understanding that we are operating in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a new normal environment, if you will, um, that won't occur uh, under the conditions uh, that we had previous to going into COVID-19. That's why our House leaders have been meeting uh, for some time now, trying to come to some type of a modified uh, sitting arrangement, if you will, so that we could uh, introduce a budget in the House and have the legislative uh, oversight that that every budget deserves. I would say this budget in particular deserves uh, not only the legislative oversight but the purview of, of every person in the province because of, of who it invests in. It invests uh, not only in rebuilding our economy through infrastructure uh, in the budget and additional uh, infrastructure commitments since then, um, but it also invests in, in communities and families and invests in, in individuals across this province. So our preference is to um, introduce and, and have a, a modified format to pass a budget uh, and have that legislative oversight. If we are una unable to come to an agreement with the, uh, uh, with the, the, the ho if the host leaders are unable to come to an agreement, um, there is other opportunities um, and already has been opportunities for the people of this province uh, to purview uh, the, not only the spending estimates but ultimately the budget before we go to an election this fall. As you mentioned, we introduced uh, to the public the spending estimates this spring. Uh, in June, we will have the release of our, of our public accounts. Uh, the Minister of Finance has already released uh, a number of different revenue projections uh, as, as uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, can best assess those at this point in time. Uh, in August, we are, and she's going to do another uh, revenue projection in June as well as, as to update uh, what we had already released. And in August, we're going to have our first quarter budget update, which will um, release uh, all of the, the investments to date, as well as the revenue uh, that the, the province has received to date, as well as the projections for the uh, rest of the year. So in our preference is to go into the House with that legislative oversight. If we are not able to come to an, if the House leaders are not able to come to an agreement on how uh, that modified structure can work, um, there will what will uh, essentially be um, all of the budgetary in information that will be released at the first quarter report. We'll take our next question from the phone line. We have Mark Smith with CTV. Hi, we're hearing from some essential businesses, especially in the trades, that uh, might be forced to close due to the slowdown in business that they're seeing as a result of the pandemic. Why don't they qualify for the uh, small business emergency payments or other provincial help? Um, so if they are uh, conducting as a, 
as a business, uh, they would uh, qualify. Um, and what we are doing um, with the investment that we have put into infrastructure is a, a monumental effort, essentially, to get uh, these folks uh, back to work and get them back to work very quickly. And you've seen some of the announcements that we've made today with respect to uh, highways investment. You will see some additional announcements in the days ahead, understanding that construction season is, a, is, a, is upon us, um, but some additional announcements in the days ahead that we hope will uh, get some of these uh, these folks, our tradespeople in community after community uh, back to work, as well as uh, uh, looking at, at some opportunities uh, to enhance uh, the opportunities for individuals to receive additional training uh, in the in the days and weeks ahead. So um, if they are conducting themselves as, a, as a, an official business entity, uh, they would qualify for the small business emergency grant. Uh, if they aren't, uh, they should know that we are uh, doing everything within our financial power uh, to uh, enhance uh, the infrastructure investment, the public infrastructure investment in this province, also uh, trying to enhance the environment to encourage private infrastructure investment in this province in, uh, in all of our industries so that these folks can get back to work and get back to work sooner rather than later. That's the goal. Follow up, Mark? Yes, um, what's the process for determining which region cases are assigned to and why was the one case reassigned from Regina to the north? That's just an adjustment made based on the uh, where the diagnosis was made but where the residence and health card is registered and just an administrative reassignment. I'll take our next question from the phone line, operator. We have Chris Vandenbrickel with News Talk 650. Hi, uh, this uh, question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, in relation to the uh, situation on Verdes and Oka Mesa, uh, what is your reaction to uh, Chief Bobby Cameron from the FSIN uh, suggesting that uh, police should stay off First Nations land unless they're invited? Well, I, I, as I said uh, in a previous question, uh, you know, the, the virus is indiscriminate in who it impacts. There are uh, cultural and religious ceremonies uh, and gatherings across uh, this province and in other areas of this nation and the world, quite frankly, uh, that have gone to great lengths to modify how they are coming together while staying uh, physically distant. The public health uh, orders that are in place apply to everyone. Uh, quite frankly, because uh, this virus applies uh, and how it spreads also uh, it applies to uh, impacts and affects everyone. Uh, so the public health orders uh, do apply uh, across this province on, uh, on all of our lands and I would uh, ask uh, and, and I will be talking to Bobby Cameron with respect to uh, how we can work together as we have with many other cultural and religious organizations and, and events and gatherings on how we can uh, do better by serving our people, um, but by also ensuring uh, that they can still remain to gather, like many other gatherings have, but, but ensure that they are staying physically distant and keeping, keeping our communities and our, our citizens safe. Follow up, Chris. Do you have a follow up, Chris? No, thank you. Great. We'll take our next question from the room, Arthur. So just today, uh, it appears Health Canada has authorized uh, uh, new serological tests uh, to detect antibodies. And I was wondering uh, for the Premier and for Dr. Shahab if, if there's any plans to incorporate that uh, into our response, particularly to know how many people might be resistant to the disease. Yeah, I, I'll let Dr. Shahab uh, speak uh, to the bulk of, of this, but serological, te serological tests are uh, uh, most certainly, I think, um, very important as we look forward uh, to the months ahead and years ahead in how we address uh, identifying not only who has who has this um, virus but who has had this virus. So they're a big part of uh, understanding who exactly has uh, who has had this virus virus and, and in our approach to uh, um, you know a n a multiple decisions that we make in the way of prep preparing for uh, health care outcomes in in the way of uh, preparing for. Uh, really our whole response uh, to COVID-19. Uh, that being said, um, there's some time before it really becomes uh, widespread, I believe, um, in, uh, for public use, if you will, and I'll let Dr. Shahab maybe speak a little bit uh, more to, uh, to that in specifics. So, uh, and I spoke to this, uh, I think, about three weeks ago as well, that we've been in constant touch with our um, uh, counterparts in Health Canada. So obviously, there were many tests that are developed throughout the world of varying quality. Um, and then the first step, of course, was to uh, have a consensus on which 
tests are accurate enough to be proved for use in Canada. So that is done by Health Canada in partnership with laboratories throughout uh, uh, the, the country. And then now that uh, tests are being approved for use, there's kind of uh, three ways in how they can be used. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the plan that was announced and, and Saskatchewan is al already a partner in that is that to deploy that to understand uh, how far the virus has spread as an adjunct to testing. So we already know, for example, that in Saskatchewan, um, you know, well, uh, less than 1% of the population actually has tested positive and about uh, just uh, about 3% of the population has been t t tested. So we already know that. And um, once the serology test is used to uh, measure the level of immunity in the population, there'll be one good thing to reconfirm that um, is our estimates of how, uh, how much COVID ha transmission has happened. Is that confirmed by sero serology or does that uh, show that the transmission is a bit higher? Because we already said that you know, mild or asymptomatic cases may never uh, present uh, or be tested, but they may have a positive serology test. So that's the one thing. The second, of course, is to understand how it can be used in the clinical environment. So, of course, the serology test doesn't help you if, to tell you if you're infectious or not. That still has to be the PCR test that is in use in, uh, in, in, in Saskatchewan and Canada, where if you get test positive, you are infectious. And depending on when your symptoms started, you are infectious for up to two weeks. Uh, uh, so that's how, uh, so the PCR test will still remain an important test. But over time, the serolo serological test may inform you were you ever infected in the past. And of course, the big answer is that uh, how much of a protection does prior infection give you? That's a question that to which a clear answer is not available. So that's another thing that um, uh, the serology test will uh, provide. But again, w once it's deployed, uh, it's used both for measuring h how wide COVID-19 uh, has spread in Canada and Saskatchewan, but also at an individual clinical level, what does it tell you about yourself? If you were never diagnosed with COVID or did have COVID in the past, uh, what does your, your serological test tell you in terms of your current immunity and how long does that immunity last? So I think there's some really important questions that the serology test will answer, but it will take several weeks to months for those, uh, you know, for that. Um, uh, those uh, surveys to be done and that interpretation to be applied in terms of its clinical relevance. Follow up, Arthur? Um, are we in any talks or negotiations to acquire some of these testing machines or are we just leaving that up to the federal government? So, so the uh, uh, Royal Roman of Public Health Lab, they are uh, in contact with uh, the National Microbiology Laboratory, so they validate the tests and will deploy them. So. Saskatchewan will be one of the uh, provinces who will be deploying that test in partnership with the National Microbiology Laboratory. Uh, uh, but then how it's used is, again, it will be used to do a population level survey, and the University of Saskatchewan is also involved in that. But then it will also be deployed trying to establish criteria about in terms of its clinical utility. Uh, but those um, guidelines still have to be developed for use in Canada. Can I just add to that, uh, Arthur, as uh, the doctor said, he used these tests in, in a little different way than the tests that we are currently using, and it wouldn't preclude uh, the tests that we're currently doing through the Gen Expert kits or the, uh, or the Roy Romano lab. It's, it's really for a different reason that you would use the, although important, and a very important tool as we look ahead uh, into the next uh, number of months. And, you know, this, this really speaks about the importance and, and, and really the, the water that we've navigated as provinces uh, collectively um, through uh, working together and, and as a nation um, of, of having access to the tools that we need to address uh, this pandemic. We had many discussions about access to, to PPE equipment, for example, and then uh, working with the federal government uh, to access that PPE equipment uh, from other areas of the world. There's been uh, challenges sometimes with the quality of, of the product that's been supplied, either domestically produced or even uh, that has been shipped in. Um, uh, there's been uh, discussions around different treatments, for example, worldwide and access to those treatments, the efficacy of those treatments, the approval, uh, whether we can actually ac access, put one, use those, tre those treatments or access those treatments. We've seen uh, the, Spartan, uh, the Spartan test kits been approved and then uh, removed uh, for, for various reasons. And, and it's really a, a new environment for us around uh, not only accessing uh, the tools that we need, but accessing uh, the tools uh, that will provide the quality of uh, outcomes uh, that we are looking for. And so there's two steps that really uh, have, to, have to happen there. I think about the vaccines and, and uh, how 
uh, you know, access sometimes mean that you, you have uh, that product within your physical boundaries, if you will, and we're very fortunate in Canada, and I would say even more fortunate in Saskatchewan, uh, to have the Vito Intervac uh, lab that's operating uh, at, the, at, at Saskatoon. And the work that the, the world leading research that they're doing with other companies around the world on, on developing a vaccine or a number of different vaccines, and that's why the investment that uh, we had joined with the federal government on in not only vaccine research, but also production of those vaccines uh, once they are approved by Health Canada, I think will prove to be a very, very important investment in our longer term approach to, uh, to addressing uh, the COVID-19 the COVID <coughs> excuse me, the COVID-19 COVID pandemic. Um, with with the, the testing that we're currently doing, we spoke about this a little bit with respect to Lalash, but I think it's important as we really pivot um, across the province, and I've asked the SHA uh, to look at, you, you know, how could we expand, understanding we have the testing capacity, how could we expand our numbers, and, and we'll look for uh, some direction on this in the next day or two, um, but how we are able to expand our testing numbers so that we can, uh, be doing some not broad-based testing, but maybe in some higher risk areas of, uh, of our communities, uh, be doing some degree of broad-based testing using that capacity that we have so that we are able to uh, take uh, the very first step earlier maybe uh, of identifying someone that is positive with COVID-19 and stepping in uh, with our contact tracing maybe a few days earlier than we otherwise would to really uh, have the opportunity to isolate these cases uh, before they become a, a facility-wide breakout or a community-wide breakout. So there's you know, places, uh, for example, um, where in, in, that are healthcare related where we might not have the entire staff to roll in and have that entire second shift uh, going. And so we really want to ensure that these, these places are, are kept um, COVID free or any COVID cases are identified very, very early so that they don't become a, a, uh, an outbreak in that facility. And one that comes to mind, uh, from my mind, first and foremost, would be the cancer agency. Um, we need to keep those types of places uh, as COVID free as possible to ensure that, uh, um, that, that we, we don't have the challenges that um, an outbreak in that facility could be. And I just use that as an example. But this is where now that we have this, this testing capacity, uh, we can really look to where can we use this testing capacity to ensure that we are, um, one, um, uh, keeping uh, any outbreaks uh, to a minimum, but two, ensuring that those outbreaks don't occur in some of our most vulnerable um, operations and locations uh, in, in Saskatchewan. We've all seen the numbers of deaths and, and how those are focused with not only the elderly but in long-term care homes. Uh, the same holds true for those that are, that are immunocompromised. And I just say that as one example, um, but this is, this is what we need to turn to in the, in the weeks and months ahead with the, uh, with the tools that we have. And one of those tools is we have a, a, a reasonable amount, I think would be a, a good word, of testing capacity that we should be now be utilizing to keep Saskatchewan people safe. Take our next question from the phone line. We have Roberta Bell with Global. Hi, my question is about the White Bridge Remand Center. I was just wondering who determines uh, who gets sent there and like what someone has to do to end up there. Are they people that don't have like a home, people who have too many people in their home? Like how, how do you figure out if someone needs to go there and who does that? Uh, Marlo, would you like to uh, clarify on that? Yes, thank you, Premier. I can speak uh, very broadly. It's a, it's a, a medical health order that uh, sends individuals there, and it's, it's for noncompliance. Uh, there are numerous uh, uh, warnings, I guess, given, uh, asking for individuals to self-isolate at a local community, uh, whether it's a self-isolation center or trailer or, or RV that we've put in place. Uh, it's for those individuals that, that fail to comply with, uh, with the local conditions and are um, a danger to the community. And typically, in, in the cases that I'm aware of, a uh, local police service is called to, to limit that individual's movement, and uh, eventually it becomes a, a necessity to put the individual into the White Birch Quarantine Center until they are no longer uh, transmitting uh, COVID, at which time they're released back into the community. Follow up, Roberta? So can you clarify how many people with COVID are there now and how many people have been there? Like, is that dangerous, you know, have that in the remand center, people who have COVID-19? It's, it's actually a separate location that was set up very early on the outbreak uh, to deal with individuals that were non-compliant. 
so it is separate, uh, and it, uh, it has, has all protocols. We worked with SHA, and uh, there are individuals in there 24-7 uh, making sure that the uh, person that is being uh, held in, in the uh, quarantine center has the supports they need. Uh, there's health individuals there 24-7. Uh, so it's uh, all the protocols and safety measures are put in place by health. And uh, at this point in time, I understand there's been a, a grand total of four uh, that has uh, come and gone. Uh, I believe there is three currently in, in the quarantine center. And we'll take our last question from the room here, Steph. Yeah, Mr. Premier, saying the preference, saying your government's preference to recall the legislature to present a full budget isn't the same thing as a commitment. So to be clear, do you commit to recalling the legislature to present a full budget, and if so, when? If uh, the House leaders are able to come to an amendable agreement on, on a modified uh, schedule for a budget to not only be introduced in the House, but to be passed in the House or, or to go to a vote in the House, um, yeah, I would, I would commit to uh, doing that. If we're not able to come to some type of an agreement, and it won't be, um, it won't be a, what it looked like before, um, we will, uh, but, the, but that is our preference. Our preference is most certainly to introduce a, a, a budget in the House, have it uh, voted on, um, have, it, have the legislative uh, scrutiny that we feel this budget uh, does uh, deserve because of the investments that it makes. So, uh, but it will be some type of a modified agreement and it's my hope that the House leaders will be able to come to an agreement on what that looks like. Follow up, Steph? Yeah, it seems like you had a bit of a change of heart or your answer changed on this one before you talked about how not many legislatures across the Canada uh, are <coughs> recalling for sitting. You talked about how the spending estimates were already tabled to like what changed? Um, I, I think it's always been our preference uh, to in some way, shape or form have a, uh, you know, the, the, the budget of the province, um, if not released in the legislature and, and has that legislative scrutiny to ensure that it is uh, being released for the purview of the people. That way, that's why it was important for us to uh, have the spending estimates uh, released uh, very early on the last day uh, that the legislature was sitting. I think uh, the other day I misspoke. Uh, they were not tabled in the legislature, but we did release them uh, to the public, as well as it was important for the Minister of Finance to come out and um, shortly after and uh, give her revenue estimates, of which she will do again in June, and ultimately um, they'll be refined as we go through the summer and, and, and what uh, in many of us hope it will be a, a full reopening of our, of our economy. Uh, there are some variations of how legislatures are sitting across uh, this nation. I believe when, uh, uh, Manitoba might be sitting um, one day a week with limited, uh, limited, uh, uh, s limited uh, um, services uh, that, are, that are occurring there. A few others are looking at it. Some are coming in and out for specific uh, bills that they might need uh, to pass. Um, for us, our focus would be if we were to have some type of modified sitting of the legislature here um, that we can agree to with the opposition, uh, would be to introduce and, and ultimately pass a budget. If we're unable to do that, um, we will uh, ensure that we have uh, that budgetary information released to the public uh, a, a number of times, but most importantly at the first quarter report uh, where we will uh, communicate uh, what e effectively will be uh, all of the information that a budget would have. And that concludes our time for today. Thanks for joining us, everyone.